morning, Brighton. Um, I'm very happy to be back here for the third time. And after speaking about uh, the optimism of technology and the future of money, I would like to talk to you about people. Um, and this is me when I was five years old in Romania. Uh, I grew up in the mountains in a small village in Transylvania. And as I grew up, I realized that my creativity and my access to inventing things, to testing things, my way of learning was conditioned uh, by the fact that the girls were supposed to, to play with uh, Barbies and uh, dolls and the boys were allowed to do more technical things and they would have like these extreme games like the Transformers. So as I grew up, I realized that played a very important role on my self-confidence and also on my curiosity. So I decided to create Hackademia in order to allow both boys and girls to play together and to learn by doing uh, in a very experiential and empirical way. And we start organizing workshops for kids around the world. Uh, and we would teach kids how to build microscopes from old webcams, uh, how to design basically robots, how to test the water that is like that they are drinking, test the food they are eating. Um, they, we also taught kids to teach each other. So this is actually the best part of Hackademia is that once one of them is understanding, they can teach others. Um, and after a while, we really realized that children and young people like to get involved in meaningful projects in their lo local communities. So we wanted to show that we should give them a chance to get involved because it's about their future as well. Um, and at, about this point, uh, at this point, I met all these people from um, AfriLabs Network. These are founders of different organizations and um, uh, movements in Africa. And they invited me to go there and work with them and teach them how to teach kids. So we started this, in, this initiative called AfriMakers because it was about makers <coughs> in Africa. And why, why is it make, making so important in Africa? Because making in Africa is not only about a hobby or building some gadgets. It's actually a cultural manifesto. It's at the heart of what people are doing. It's not a commodity, it's a necessity. So, we, you, you could notice how people are building boats out of a tree, uh, how they are like creating their own fridges because there's no other alternative. They have their own welding gas. And we decided based on this know-how and local tradition to actually enable and empower young people to solve problems in their local community. And we selected 10, team, 10 teams from all around Africa to propose projects they wanted to work on to, to solve a challenge in their local community. Uh, we started in Alexandria in Egypt, and this was the team of mentors I was training them. Uh, each team of mentors was receiving like one of our mobile labs, just enough to get them started with rapid prototyping, like some Arduino bo boards, some, uh, a Raspberry Pi, some sensors. And the best part is that after they were designing a, a project, they had to go to schools and community centers and teach to, to kids. Um, and this is one of the projects that was developed in Alexandria. I really like this project because we talk a lot about conductive ink and all these industrial projects. They actually managed to do conductive paint with vitamin C. And you can also do that in your kitchen today. And then the most proactive mentors from Alexandria would travel with me to Kenya to train the new team of mentors over there. So like this, they would pass on knowledge and also get to know people that they could collaborate with within their, uh, their region. Um, and I think this is really important to enable local people to share ideas and solutions because they share the same context, they share the, uh, share the same resources, and our desire to go and help is not always helping. Um, and these are pictures from um, some slums in Kenya where our uh, mentors went to train. So the contrast is huge. In 2014, we have schools in Kenya where every child has a computer, like the private schools, but we also have schools in the middle, middle of a slum like this where a, a million people are living. And I wanted our mentors to be exposed to that and to understand why it's important for them to work with both of these communities. After that, we went to Tanzania. Um, here we had a, a project, for example, on the, on the microscope. We went to Rwanda. We had to go to schools where there was no electricity uh, and like drive on dirty roads for hours. Um, we also had the big challenge of accessing parts and electronics. 
So the local mentors had to invent and create their new boards. This is like an Arduino board that is only two dollars and a half that they put together by using all the electronic parts. Um, we worked under harsh conditions. The longest time I stayed without electricity was in Botswana for five days. Um, and I think you know it's it's very important to to look at this experience and journey of making around Africa uh, as something that we could all learn from, like all the conditions we have for prototyping, learning, going to work, we kind of take them for granted. Um, and these people don't have the same conditions, but at the same time, because they are facing all these big challenges, they are sometimes more creative and better at improvising. Um, and after doing this whole journey of, of making, we actually uh, documented all the projects and the stories. There is a book that will be launched next month uh, on this project. And there are a few learnings that I wanted to share with you today. Um, one of the important things that I learned in this journey, I was there for four months, is to let go. Uh, there are a lot of things that I had to adapt to and I didn't understand and I was there more as an enabler. Uh, but I really, really wanted to focus on the people and the process and not on the outcomes because the idea of this project was to plant the seeds for local collaboration long term. So it didn't matter what would happen in the immediate, uh, that what were the immediate results of these workshops, it mattered more if these people would stay engaged and continue to work on this project. Um, don't compromise on values. The reason why we selected local teams that would propose projects to solve problems in their local communities because we thought like these people could connect at a value level. And once we connect on a value level, everything else works. Um, use humor when things become overwhelming. People always ask me because I travel a lot and work with people around the world, how do I constantly adapt? And I think humor is one of the best way for, for doing that. Um, don't forget there are 15 stones. This comes from a, a Zen Buddhist temple in Japan. They always have 15 stones, but no matter where you sit in the temple, you're not able to see all the stones. And this is kind of a, a spatial lesson that we, it's really hard for us as a species to have an overview and to be able to always kind of understand how things are related and how things function. Um, and just accepting the fact that we can't see it all and we can't understand it all and question the way we see and understand things is important. Empty your cup, this is also like from, from Zen Buddhism. Uh, we all want, can learn from each other, but we need to be in a, have this man, mental attitude to, to be willing and ready to learn from each other. Um, and uh, as I told you, this was in the beginning of this year, so I wanted to show you what's the progress and the status of the, some of the people that participated in the projects. Um, Opemipo, who's only 21 years old, ever since has organized 10 workshops, 10 additional trainings for local mentors in Nigeria. They went to schools and has started an internship at Intel, and he's constantly uh, uh, pushing this maker movement in Nigeria and pushing new activities for, for his, his fellow students. Um, I also wanted to, to share the updates from Sharif. He uh, was one of our mentors in Alexandria, one of our fellows. Um, ever since Sharif actually started a company, his company is called The Resha. Uh, they are building a mobile laser cutter for craftspeople. Um, you, most of the laser cutters today are around 3,000 uh, euros. Their laser, laser cutter is actually 250 uh, euros, and it's meant and built for craft women in Egypt to make their work easier and to enable them to earn more. Um, I also wanted to share the story of our fellow from Botswana, Bokamoso, who is 23. She actually participated in a project in Berlin this summer where we built uh, an invention lab in a shipping container. Um, and I'm gonna play a small video where she talks about her experience with Afrimakers and the camp. Hi, what's your name? My name is Muka Musopalai, and I'm um, uh, from Botswana. And where are we now? We are in Berlin, here for a maker camp, which is um, about making and creating co-projects cool with the resources that we have. And what was your project at Maker Camp? My project at Maker Camp was, was an electricity monitor, which, which measures the um, amount of electricity consumption in homes. And how does that work? 
Uh, how it works is that we used a sensor, um, a current sensor that mm -hmm. looks like this, where you, yeah, it's a sort of a magnetic field here, where you put a cable that you want to measure current flow in, mm -hmm. then you close it, you run a program in the, the program that we wrote in the Arduino environment, and then it just measures the current consumption for the thing. And why did you want to do this project? I wanted to do this project because from back home we have a lot of uh, we have shortage of electricity, and a lot of people are not aware of the amount of um, electricity they are using and how they are consuming it. So I wanted to create something that will make them aware of the consumption that they are doing and how by so doing they will be able to see that okay I'm consuming this much is how much I can spread hmm. down so that you have enough for everyone. And what's your plan now that you go back home? How are you going to continue this project? Okay, my plan is to tell people about the project, try to test it out in the market and see the acceptance of it. And then from there, if they are more interested, get the community more involved in the project and try to develop something much more effective and get it in the market. And what did you learn at Maker Camp that you didn't expect it to learn? I learned so much, we could talk all day. Um, I learned that project management is virtue. Like, you have to know, you have to have a step-by-step -step plan on how you do your project from day one to accomplishing the project. Um, I'm not a person who is a public speaker, so we were forced to learn how to talk to the public and interact with people, and I thought that was a very valuable lesson. Um, what else? We learned how to make the maker space, as you can see it, and then the process of actually doing something like this from the recycled materials and stuff. So, yeah, that was the most valuable lessons that I had. And if you were to choose a favorite moment at the maker camp, what would that be? Favorite moment was the success of the maker camp. Mm. Like, um, the project, finishing the projects on time and presenting them, and actually having people that like the audience were impressed with what we had so I enjoyed that very much <laughs> that we managed even you know, if we had one month and we managed to succeed. And if you had a message with young to young uh, women back home, what would you tell them? I would tell them the um, making field, electronics, engineering field is not just for men. We also can do this. As you can see, I managed to create something that is very useful and very electronic. I had to learn to use a circuit and mechatronics. I had to learn mechatronics. But I managed, even though I'm a female, and they all can do that. So they shouldn't be afraid of the fields. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I know this is not as sexy as synthetic biology and artificial intelligence, but these are the pains of growth of starting to actually implement that and distributing our future. Um, for Bocamoso to come to, to Berlin, she, we had to call the Botswana embassy for three weeks every single morning to get her visa. We had three other mentors from Africa that couldn't come to our camp um, afterwards, and she had to stand against her mother, the Minister of Transportation of the country, and many other people that were trying to convince her to stay and not lose a semester from university, although she knew she would pass the exams. So for a girl her age to be that brave is actually really admirable. And uh, ever since she, she went back, like in the past two months, in Botswana, in Gaborone, she's leading presentation workshops, training, continuing to work on her electricity consumption, consumption monitor and this is how, what it means when you're trying to, to take an idea, to tra take the technology, solve problems, and actually do it with local people and local communities, step by step. Um, and, and I think this is important because I came across this, this study from MIT. Um, and we, we talked about money and growth and innovations. And actually, um, uh, some of these researchers from MIT discovered that the metric that is the most telling at predicting our growth across the planet is actually the, the uh, economic complexity. 
And this economic complexity is defined by the diversity of activities within the society and the diversity of products. And actually, this is a, a graph uh, where you could see where we stand. Like on, on the first line, we have the economic complexity. And on the other side, we have GDP per person, per capita. Um, Europe and Asia are on the uh, right side. And all the yellow dots are the countries in Africa. So why is that? Like, if we, we take a closer look, um, this is what US exports. And you can see it's very diversified. Anything from cars, medicine, machines. Um, this is the one for UK. So our economy is quite complex. And we have a whole range uh, of activities. But if we look at Nigeria, which is actually one of the biggest economies right now in, in Africa, this is how it looks like. Um, so where does this diversity come from? Um, it's a lot around tacit knowledge, around communities of practice, around capacity building. Um, this is also like how, how products are connected. Everything you see in uh, violet is chemical products. Everything you see in blue is machine products. Everything we do is connected, which is why this type of growth is only going to last as long. Um, and as we look into, into the change and as we have all these people looking at the future of Africa, reducing poverty, I actually think that this change starts with people. Um, so this is uh, an equation that I imagined this morning. Um, so I, I think time, you know, we, we can think about change like in amounts of time multiplied with the work, which is defined by innovation and R&D, and divided by the number of people and the amount of collaboration that is happening between all these people. And I want you to look at this imagined equation, and I think the key element there is time. We do not give these people the time to create their own solutions, to develop their own initiatives, to develop their own project, their own industry. There is too much foreign intervention happening right now in Africa. And the change there is not going to come from all this funding that we are pushing on the trends. Um, it's actually going to come from developing local infrastructure, from developing local diversity, from recognizing old local know-how and encouraging it. Um, and I think, I think this is important and relevant for all of us, because if we think about the history of innovations and the, the history of manufacturing, um, we kind of went from this, which is Bell Labs, Tesla, when they, they invented the first satellite in 1970s, to this. This is innovation today, by the way. Like, this is how we build things. Um, and I think there's something fundamentally wrong with it. Um, and my message for you today is that I think in the face of all these complex challenges that we're you know, handling, uh, we need to play together. Uh, we can't have the arrogance of thinking we are better or more intelligent. And we need to accept the difference and recognize it um, and not impose our values over other people and actually invite them to the conversation and invite them to think with us how we're going to deal with these challenges and with these problems that affect us all in terms of climate change, economic crisis. Um, so. Yeah, that was my message for, for you today. And I, I think um, one question that I would like to, to leave you with is what is meaningful for you? How can we add value in what we do every single day? And how can we work on meaningful projects together and kind of challenge our views and challenge the way we were brought up in a particular system? So yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you.